Hi, everybody. Welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and tonight we're going to be talking about Jesus and the community. Uh, so this week we've, we're talking about uh, outreach and uh, churches that are making a difference. And uh, I want, before we get started with anything, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunity that we can come together to study your word, to learn how we can make a positive impact on our community. We pray that you would bless us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we officially get started talking about the lesson, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how you can participate in tonight's programming. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. The first way is by web camera. So if you're on using the Uvu software, all you have to do is um, just add Inspirited Network to your, uh, to your friends list. And then once you uh, are on during the broadcast times uh, and you log in, we'll be able to talk face to face. All you have to do is just dial Inspirited Network and then uh, we'll be connected on Uvu and we'll be able to communicate uh, just raise one finger into the air when you're ready to make a comment or ask a question, and we will uh, put you on screen with us so we can talk face-to-face. -face. If you don't already have the Uvu software installed on your computer, you can just go to uvu.com and uh, download it and then add an Inspirited Network to your friends list. Now, if you don't want to be seen but you want to be heard, uh, then you can call in through the telephone conference line. The way that you do that is by dialing in 712-432-3066 and, the, and then the access code number, which is 426 101. Again, the access code number, which is 426-101. Anytime you want to ask a question, make a comment, you just press five star on your telephone keypad and we will unmute your line. So again, five star on your telephone keypad and we will unmute your line. Now, if you uh, don't have a regular landline or cell phone that can call the U.S., but you still want to be able to call in through the telephone conference line, uh, you can call in using Skype. So if you have a paid Skype account that can call the U.S., you just dial in the same exact number, 712-432-3066. And then the access code number, which is 426101. Uh, when you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can hit five star on Skype's telephone keypad, and we'll be able to unmute your line that way. It works the exact same way. Now, if you don't have a paid Skype account, but you still want to call in by phone conference, uh, you can just call in using Skype itself, doing a free Skype to Skype call. Just call in Spirited 2 on Skype, and then we'll be able to log you in that way. Now, if you don't want to be seen and you don't want to be heard, but you still want a way to participate, uh, you can use any of the text chats that are associated with each broadcaster that we're currently broadcasting on. So right now, we're actually on DeCast. Uh, that's one of the newer broadcasters that we're on. Uh, we're on Ustream, Old Livestream, Google Hangouts, YouTube, and a few other platforms. So if you're watching this live through any of those channels, uh, you can just uh, type a message in the text chat, and we'll, be we'll get your comments and questions right here in the studio. Um, you also have the option to send me a message directly through Facebook. Just send it to John Spellman. If you're having trouble finding me, you can send it... Um, you can just send it to uh, facebook.com forward slash inspirited network, and then I'll, I'll be able to get your, your comments or your question that way as well. Um, so if, you're, uh, if you have the uh, invitation that I sent out on Facebook, you can also post a comment in that as well, and I'll get your, uh, your comments and question and read it aloud as we're, uh, as we're going forward with the broadcast. So those are all the different ways that you can participate. And again, without your participation, this broadcast would not be what it is. So uh, you know, feel free if... At any point in the time in the lesson, we may go forward and you have a question about something that we might have already covered. You're more than welcome to go back to it. Um, and tonight, we actually have two special guests with us. We have uh, uh, Dr. Colon and Dr. Colon, um, who wrote the, uh, the book, um, Adventist Churches That Make a Difference, and also uh, the, uh, the Sabbath School Quarterly Lesson itself this, this, um, this quarter. So um, they'll be on with us to uh, talk about the lesson. 
And with that said, we are ready to begin tonight's programming. So this week we're talking about Jesus on community outreach. And we're going to start off with Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. So let's just uh, turn there. Matthew chapter 24, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. Which says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So this tells us about how Jesus went about making a difference in people's lives. Um, you know, the ministry of Jesus, if you think about ministry, uh, who's the, who, who could be a better example to us than Jesus himself, God who came down in human flesh and uh, dwelt among us and ministered to people's needs, uh, not only ministering to their, to their perceived needs, but also to needs that they did not yet know that they had. Um, so, one of Jesus' well-known teachings is that we, as members of the church, are the light of the world. Um, and so, if we are the light of the world, then we, like him, participate in drawing souls who are lost uh, to the light. And so, uh, Christians are called to be the light of the world, just like Jesus was the light of the world. Turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 5 and, uh, and verse 14, which says... Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So what did Jesus mean here by people don't light candles unless they want the light to be seen? So the whole purpose here, I guess, behind lighting a candle is that if you light a candle, chances are you want that light to be visible. Um, so what, what does this mean in the context of the church? Um, is, is there an aspect of, of, uh, of church life in which, you know, sometimes people may tend to hide the light that they have as opposed to showing it? Um, or, you know, what, what exactly is the message that Jesus is trying to get across to us here about being the light of the world? And in what circumstances might people desire to hide that light? What are your thoughts? Okay, so we got a comment coming in. Uh, people desire to hide that light when they are fearful of the world. Okay, so that's true. You know, a lot of times in order to be a Christian, uh, a person can um, come into conflict with the rest of the world. You know, sometimes uh, the things that we witness to the world in, on, on, on behalf of Christ are things that make the world upset or that things that rub them the wrong way. So a lot of times people tend to want to hide the fact that they're light uh, in order to uh, get along with people in order to get them to think, hey, you know, I'm not as, uh, you know, staunch or I'm not as, um, you know, Christian as you might think. I'm just like you. And sometimes people want to fit in with the rest of the world. But Jesus here points out that a person doesn't want to hide the light when they light a candle. Uh, and so we as Christians, if we have light and everything else is in darkness, then we should want that light to be seen rather than hidden away. So in essence, it seems that Jesus is, is telling us here that we should not be ashamed of what we are and what our purpose is. Uh, the purpose of a candle is to illuminate a room, especially in those times before there were light bulbs and, and things of that nature. So the, the, a candle would have illuminated the area where, where, it was, uh, where, it was, um, where it was brought. But here, Jesus is telling us that we, like a candle, need to illuminate the darkness that is around us. And I like the way that the lesson puts uh, this phrase. It says, Jesus' teachings uh, which he modeled in his own earthly ministry, provide powerful instructions concerning how we, through him, can poke holes in the darkness. So we, as as Jesus's candles, we as Jesus's light, uh, need to poke holes in the darkness all around us. And if you if you think about the concept of poking holes in darkness, um, you know, whenever you poke a hole in something, you have just one little small hole in the midst of tons of of uh, you know paper. If you're if you're using paper. So if you're poking holes in the darkness, you might not have the biggest impact. 
Uh, but just in your own sphere, with, with it, within your own sphere of influence, you can make a, a, a difference. And with everyone shining their light in their respective locations, poking holes in the darkness, before you know it, uh, you might have a great area illuminated. Let's take a look at uh, Luke chapter 4 and verse 15 for a moment. All right, see, we got a comment coming in. So let me go ahead and grab that. Um, I believe it's by web camera. You are on the air. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay, good. Well, one of the ways that you can shine your light is by uh, applying this verse to your life. Mm -hmm. And it's found in Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 16. And the Bible says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Mm -hmm. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. End quote. Emphasis my new King James Version. So you see that it, in order to shine our light, we have to be, one, wise as serpents, and two, harmless as doves. Amen. So in Luke chapter 4 and verse 15, the Bible tells us, uh, and he, talking about Jesus, taught in their synagogues being glorified of all. So when Jesus preached, um, he drew people. You know, people were interested to hear what he had to say. And, uh, you know, people paid attention to him. They came to see him and to hear him. Um, and it tells us that uh, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, um, this shows us that Jesus was in the habit of keeping the Sabbath and that uh, it was customary for him to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath and to read the scriptures. And as he's reading the scriptures that particular, um, in this particular instance on the Sabbath, he, he reads from the prophet Isaiah and he finds the place where it's written. And let's take a look at verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So here we see that Jesus uh, would be the one who would be anointed and bring forth good news uh, that would bring hope to all people. But what's interesting is that it focuses here on the less fortunate. So in other words, the gospel wasn't just something for the rich, those who were perfect, those who didn't have problems, uh, those who could see, those who you know didn't have anything to worry about. But instead, we find that the gospel was for people who were poor, people who were brokenhearted, people who needed deliverance, people who were captives, people who were thrown in prison, people who were without sight, uh, those who were bruised. Um, and so we find that the gospel here is, is uh, a word of encouragement to the less fortunate. And I think that that's part of the reason why Jesus's message had such great appeal, because in this uh, society, many people seem to think that those who were less fortunate were castaways. They didn't pay as much attention to them. They weren't good enough. But here, Jesus targeted them in his ministry. And another interesting thing is when we take a look at the last part of that verse in verse 19, it says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, what was the acceptable year of the Lord? Are we talking about the day of the Lord at the end of time? Uh, are we talking about maybe um, a, a, a special sabbatical year? What exactly was this uh, acceptable year of the Lord? What was Jesus referring to here? Okay, so I gather that you guys are not sure. So I'm going to uh, invite our guests on um, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Jubilee year, because when Jesus talked about here the, um, the acceptable year of the Lord uh, or the year of the Lord's favor, he was referring um, to the Jubilee year, which was also mentioned in, uh, in Isaiah.
So I'm going to uh, go ahead and bring them on to uh, discuss that a little bit further and to go into a little bit more detail with it than I can. Okay. Yeah. Hello, welcome. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that the year of the Lord's favor, well, it is known as the Jubilee, and Leviticus 25.10 talks about that. And this Jubilee was very, very interesting. Our book outlines what happens. It's a time of freedom. It's a time of celebration. It's everybody that had had lost their property or even sold it, would receive it back. The debts were forgiven. Slaves could return home to their families, and prisoners would be released. And it was sort of like a re rebooting of society, hmm. so that everybody, every two years, would be on an equal footing again. And, and, and it's interesting also that history shows that there was no, there's no record in the Bible or outside of it of, of an actual observance of jubilee in the full sense of the word. There was just too much selfishness in society back then, and well, not only back then. <laughs> and so 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 they said, well when the Messiah comes, he'll do it. He'll do it. And he'll 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 make this jubilee happen. And um, and so you know so there he goes. He 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 says that's his mission statement. Uh, Luke 4 is his mission statement. And he and uh, and he's gonna be the one to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor or to make Jubilee happen. Yeah, and you'll notice that everything that he reads from <laughs> Isaiah um, 61 is um, has to do with freedom, <clears throat> opening the eyes of the blind, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and um, there's uh, just uh, a, a, a spirit of, of um, unity and freedom that is given to the people. <clears throat> yeah, and, and it's interesting also that when Jesus announced, he's, he, he said to proclaim the year of the Lord, some year of the Lord, he, he said to make Jubilee happen. And if you look at Isaiah 61, they did say that in the lesson, he, he stopped in, in mid-sentence. He because he really is quoting Isaiah 61, and if you look in Isaiah 61, mm -hmm. um, verse 2, again, it's the same, pretty much that, that first part of that chapter is the same as what Jesus quoted. And then he says, release from darkness the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus stopped right there, but, but the rest of it, in, from which he's quoting, and the day of vengeance of our God, he, he uh, didn't say that for some reason. Hmm. And again, the lesson pointed out that that's what the rabbis and the religious establishment was te were teaching that the Romans would be conquered by this Messiah and 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 then bring vengeance upon these terrible oppressors. And uh, but Jesus did not come for that. He did not come for that. He came to be a healer and and to release the oppressed. So he didn't emphasize that enough at all because that was being emphasized too much. <laughs> yeah, everybody <laughs> wanted uh, freedom from the uh, from, from Roman rule. And so when he comes the second time, that will be the time for the vengeance on evil. And he uh, talks about that in Thessalonians. Amen. So anyway, that's a little a summary. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I pre appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, I want to I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Isaiah chapter sixty one and verse uh, one and two, um, which talked about. Uh, actually, I'm going to read it for you. So in Isaiah sixty one uh, verse one, the Bible says, "The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to com uh, to comfort all that mourn." So if you read this version compared to Luke's version, uh, Jesus mentions pretty much everything that's said here in verses 1 and 2. The only part that he doesn't speak about is the day of vengeance of our God. And so when you think about the day of vengeance, we're talking about uh, a time when God will ultimately, like we read in Daniel, where God will overthrow the kingdoms and overthrow the nations and will set up an everlasting kingdom which will never be destroyed. But to uh, the people living in the first century AD, that would have meant overthrowing the Romans. You, you'll remember from past studies that we've done where you know there was this bias where people were constantly looking for a Messiah 
but their concept of the Messiah was that was the one who was going to lead them in a military battle against the Romans and th and overthrow their oppressors. But before that could happen, Jesus wanted to them to understand their spiritual needs because um, you know the, the spiritual needs were more important than overthrowing the Romans. In fact, uh, there were many Romans who God wanted to reach. But at this point in, in time in their history, the Jews seemed not to be able to understand that God wanted to reach these individuals. They were only concerned with their oppression. But you'll remember that God led them into captivity uh, because of their disobedience and because of God wanting to teach them. So in spite of the oppression and the, the, and the uh, misfortunes that they were going through as a result of, uh, of Roman rule, uh, God allowed these things to happen so as to teach them. And we, and we see all of this prophesied in the book of Daniel, especially in, uh, in chapter 7. Uh, and, you know, the, Rome was the, uh, the, fourth, uh, the fourth world power, the fourth beast. Um, but here, Jesus purposely leaves out um, the day of vengeance of our God so as not to get them to overthink, uh, you know, and, and consider him the one who's going to overthrow the Romans right then and there, which is what they were looking for. Um, now, let's take a look at the um, next text, which is uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. Uh, actually, you know what? let's go to, uh, yeah, we'll look at Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. Luke 10, 25 to 37. And it says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy, and thy neighbor as thyself. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, afterwards, Jesus answers him with a parable. But I want to pitch this question to the audience. When Jesus, when Jesus is asked this question, who is my neighbor? Who often do we think of as our neighbors? What are your thoughts? Okay, looks like we got a comment coming in. You are on the air. Go ahead, Andrew. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, I think that, um, who, who, do, who does the world think of their neighbor is? It's probably uh, those, who that, those who they think they can pay, that, that, that can pay them back, mm -hmm. those that they think can pay them back, and also those that can be a blessing to themselves. Because, it's, and you, you can see this in Luke chapter 14, not just in our day, but in Christ's day too, from Luke chapter 14, Verse 14, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And the context of, it was in the context of Luke 14, it was in the context of, for verse 7 to 14, it's in the context of taking the lowly place and helping those mis those less fortunate than mm -hmm. yourself. And so, it so in Christ's day, as in our day too, who who our neighbor is, they the world thinks those who can help them back, those who can repay them back, mm -hmm. and those that can be a blessing to themselves. Because this world, would like uh, Mary, 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 Mary Allen and Gasper, I think it is, like they're saying, what is that there? It's like uh, it's a it's. Oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> sorry about that. It's, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Andrew. I'm gonna um, just add on to a little bit of what you what you were saying there. Um, I think you know you you were correct in saying that the world often does think of those who um, you know can pay them back or who can do for them as their neighbors. You know, uh, often if you were asked if you were to ask somebody 
uh, who is your neighbor? They're going to think about their next door neighbor. That's That would be the most common response uh, in today's time. Uh, but when we talk about uh, being neighborly and caring for people in the community, um, you know, our neighbors are really the people who are in within our sphere of influence. Um, and it seems that this individual seemed only to uh, consider those who were closest to him as his neighbor. The fact that he even throws out the question, who is my neighbor, uh, suggests that he wants to be exclusive with the term. And when you use, uh, you know, an exclusive process for choosing who your neighbors are, uh, then you run into problems. I mean, for one thing, people who are closest to us, maybe family, friends, or people who live right next door to us, can often uh, cause such problems uh, and such damages to relationships that in the long run, they can prove not to be your neighbor. Um, so clearly, neighbor here is not meant to, meant to indicate um, those who we like or those who live within close proximity, but rather, um, Jesus seems to apply this to a much broader term. And to do this, he sets across a, a, a parable in which he illustrates an instance in which a person would normally hate the individual, but has no choice but to love him because of the fact that he helps him out when nobody else would, even those closest to him. And so uh, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan in which he, uh, and we're gonna read in a few moments, but in this parable, he puts across a situation where you know, the Samaritans at that time were hated. Uh, they were considered not to really be uh, the true uh, um, descendants of the Israelites uh, in, in Samaria. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of discrepancy about uh, whether or not their lineage was actually, um, you know, from the, from the Israelites or if they were just kind of imposters. So the Jews, uh, as we learn in scripture, had no dealings with the Samaritans. There was a lot of bad blood between the two groups. So the last person that, a, that an individual would ever think was his neighbor would be a Samaritan, uh, regardless of where he lived. You know, the Jews did not like or care for the Samaritans. Um, they were enemies. Um, and another interesting point is that the Samaritans seem not to like the Jews, because when we look at uh, when Jesus is going, um, you know, back to, uh, I believe it was Jerusalem, he was headed, when he, when he was faced in a certain direction uh, and, and uh, was passing through Samar Samaria, the Samaritans would not receive him because of the fact that um, he was not minded to stay to stay with them, but was minded to go toward uh, Jerusalem, I, be, I believe it was. So uh, these two groups clearly did not get along. But Jesus puts across an instance where a Samaritan show, does an act of kindness toward a Jew, whereas two uh, Jewish brothers ignore the individual. And that really puts across this big question of who is your neighbor when the people that are supposed to be your brothers and sisters turn their backs on you and the person that's supposed to be your enemy shows you kindness. And we can bring that kind of home to us today where, you know, suppose you, you know, you're asked the question, who's your neighbor? Is it, is it just the people that you go to church with or just the people that are, that are close to you in terms of relationships? You know, there are instances in which, uh, you know, maybe it's your brother or your sister in the church doesn't do anything to help you out. But a person who is not even a, a Christian believer on the street might actually do something uh, to help you out or, or to show you an act of kindness. There are, ch there are, uh, are times when a family member or, or a friend uh, might turn their backs on you, but then somebody who you would never expect, maybe somebody who you never even thought you'd get along with, uh, shows you an act of kindness. So as human beings, we naturally tend to have this exclusive mentality where we only like those who like us, and we only do for those who we expect would do the same thing for us. But Jesus broadens the gap here and shows an instance in which a person that you would never think would do something to help out actually does something to help out when the people who you would assume would have helped choose not to. Let's take a look at that. Uh, we're looking at Luke chapter uh, 10. We're going to start with uh, verse 30. And Jesus tells this parable. He says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his, of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So in other words, that would be the equivalent of your pastor passing by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. That would be like your local elder. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, come, uh, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him 
and bound up his wounds and pouring in uh, and pouring in oil on, and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow he went, and when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to, uh, to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? I see we got a uh, comment coming in. You are on the air. I uh, was uh, thinking it's it's a matter of perspective actually. Um, the uh, the priest and the Levite are um, their concerns uh, is uh, if I do something for this person, <clears throat> what will happen to me? Mm -hmm. Whereas the Samaritan is saying, if I help this man, if I do not help this man, what will happen to him? Uh, it, 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 we have selfish motives very often mm -hmm. that lead us to ignore the needs of others because we're concerned about our own needs, uh, not realizing that if we care for the needs of others, God will take care of our needs. And, you know, one of the interesting things that I, that I thought was, um, was put across here is the fact that this individual uh, or actually the, the priest and the Levite were so concerned about being ritually pure. So in other words, they had a religious reason or at least a pretended religious reason uh, to avoid this man and not help him. So they put uh, rites and ceremonies and, you know, being ceremonially uh, impure above uh, helping out a person who was in great need. So in other words, they basically had uh, religious reasons uh, not to help this individual. But the Samaritan, who is not part of this system, chooses to help. And you'll remember on several, several occasions where Jesus said, uh, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And, you know, when Jesus was accused of healing on the Sabbath and, and therefore breaking the Sabbath, or when Jesus was accused of allowing his disciples to eat the corn on the Sabbath, um, you know, on many occasions he taught this lesson um, that, that uh, God is about mercy rather than sacrifice. And so a lot of times uh, people put uh, religious rituals ahead of uh, being a blessing to somebody who's in need. And we, and he, and Jesus even cites the example of King David when he was hungry, uh, comes into the synagogue and eats from the showbread. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that people sometimes will put religion ahead of, uh, uh, helping a person that's in need when really God tells us that the weightier matters of the law are justice, mercy, compassion, you know, having, uh, compassion on a person rather than just going through the, the rituals of, of, of a person's faith. Now, that's not to say that rituals aren't important at all, but that is to say that, you know, when a person is in need, that, you know, we should have compassion on people, and that really ultimately is what God would want. And we saw that uh, in Isaiah chapter 58, where people were talking about having um, a, fasting, uh, a, a fasting time, and instead of... Uh, stopping their wickedness or, or relieving the oppressed or having mercy on, on, on widows and orphans. They were continuing a system of oppression um, all while fasting and praying and asking God for help and then wondering why God wasn't answering them and why God wouldn't hear them. So it shows us that is fasting important? Sure it is. But when you fast and you still do the same thing that you've been doing uh, that's displeasing to God, how sincere can you really say that your fast is? Um, so here in this instance, we see how uh, these two uh, religious individuals, you have a, a, a Levite and you also have a priest, basically exempt themselves from showing compassion on a person for religious reasons. And this is what I think, uh, I believe it's Thessalonians talks about, where it says people can have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Let me just grab that text. It's actually in, I'm sorry, not uh, Thessalonians, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Is it possible today that many of us in the name of religion can have a form of godliness, but deny the very power of it by refusing to help people and recognize who our neighbor is? So uh, going back to the, the story, Jesus basically tells this individual, um, you know, which of these three was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? Now, you would think the answer would be the priest or the Levite. But in this instance, it's the Samaritan because he shows compassion. And so when the individual answers what Jesus says, uh, verse 37, it says, and he said, 
he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do thou likewise. And in these words, Jesus broadens the meaning of neighbor, because rather than it being the people that we want to be our neighbor or that we want to think about as our neighbors, Jesus opened it up to whomever you show compassion on. That person is your neighbor. And the reverse also is true. Whoever shows compassion on you is your neighbor. And so there's no limit uh, to who can show compassion on another person. Here, even though the Samaritan was unlikely to show compassion, he chooses to. And so effectively, he, he demonstrates his, his, uh, his willingness to be uh, the Jew's neighbor. And so today, there's no telling who you can show compassion on and who can show compassion on you. So really, our neighbor can be anyone in the world who we can show compassion to or who can show compassion to us. And so since there is no limit to who we can show compassion to, effectively, our neighbor is every person who we come in contact with who we can have an influence on. Now, when we think about how this applies to us today, um, you know, you might have a person in your life who, you know, maybe has uh, given you a hard time or who has, uh, you know, been a burden or who has, uh, you know, maybe rubbed you the wrong way. Um, but that person effectively is your neighbor. And, you know, what's really interesting is that when you show kindness to a person, especially when they may not deserve it or when they might not even think that they deserve it, you actually can open up the doors to great friendships. You know, you think about how Jesus talked about loving your enemies. By loving your enemies and showing kindness to people, um, you can you can actually create friends in a situation where a person might not have at first liked you. And uh, it makes me think of uh, uh, Deuteronomy. I forget the chapter off him, but there was actually uh, a set of laws for showing compassion on a person. So one such law in the book of Deuteronomy talked about how if um, you saw your neighbor's, uh, if you saw somebody's donkey and that donkey was running away, or it had collapsed under a burden. And uh, it was impossible for the person who owned that donkey to take care of it and to help it out. Uh, and that person just so happened to be your enemy. Uh, the law basically stated that you were not to, just to stand there and laugh at the individual and say, ah, you know, too bad for you. But rather you were supposed to go and help that individual and, uh, and not allow him to just stand there on his own. So the law basically made allowances for showing basic kindnesses to people, even if you didn't like them. And so effectively, I mean, imagine being in that situation where somebody that you don't like is, is present and some misfortune befalls you and then you uh, receive help from that individual rather than them standing there taunting you. That right there could create friendships. And so we see that embedded in the law is restoration of relationships because it wasn't God's will that people remain enemies. And by showing kindness, even to people that we uh, may be at odds with, we actually can create friendships. So there's actually a, a great hidden purpose behind these words. All right, so we got a comment coming in. You are on the air, go ahead. You're on the air. Okay, I'm not sure if you're referring to me. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Okay, Cole. if you're referring to me, yes. um, another question is not only who is, is my neighbor, but we all also need to be asking, what kind of a neighbor am I? Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a while. Amen. Amen. So Jesus tells the um, this individual to go and do likewise, and I think that uh, Mayellen's point about you know what kind of what kind of a neighbor am I? is really crucial here because uh, if we go out and we do what Jesus was telling this individual to do, then we should show compassion on people even if we are at odds with them. You know, uh, in some cases, we might be the Samaritan uh, that's helping out somebody who's in need uh, who may not like us, but imagine uh, what, what it does to the relationship when you go above and beyond to help the person out. Uh, so, you know, the gospel uh, is not only teaching us to be kind to people who are kind to us, but to be kind to those who wouldn't be kind to us. And if you think about it, that's exactly what God does. God is kind to the unthankful and to the unholy. God is kind to people who, are, who wouldn't be thankful or grateful toward him. And so if we are going to be perfect like our Father in heaven is perfect, then we have to show kindness even to people who don't like us or who wouldn't be grateful for that kindness.
I want to talk about uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and, uh, and verse 13. So let's go there for a moment. And it says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath, have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth, is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So here Jesus is talking about his, his disciples, and he says that uh, we are basically the salt of the earth. And this applies to us today as well. In what way are we the salt of the earth? And, and why does Jesus refer to his people as salt? What does salt do? And, and what does it have to do with Christian living? What are your thoughts? Okay, looks like we got a comment coming in. All right. You are on the yes, air. Uh, thank you. Um, salt has to mix some, uh, with something other than itself. Mm -hmm. um, if you just keep salt to itself, um, it's not going to do anybody or anything any good. Mm -hmm. It has to mix with, with ingredients other than itself. Uh, another thing uh, that uh, that we are the salt of the earth uh, means that uh, that salt is not the whole recipe. Um, that uh, that it it doesn't take a whole lot of salt to make a difference. Um, these are these are essentials to understanding uh, that uh, we are the salt of the earth, and we lose uh, our our savor. Uh, when we when we uh, either get contaminated or when when we just clump together and um, and do not do anything, you know. Someone else, a friend of mine, a friend of mine said once, it's easier to be light, to be the light of the world, than to be the salt of the earth. Hmm. And I thought to myself, why did he say that? <laughs> And uh, I mean, maybe I maybe I should ask you. <laughs> why, why, why would my? He's actually my boss that said that. Why would he say that? It's easier to be the light of the world than, than the salt, salt of the earth. You know, it's interesting and because I'll, 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 you have a chance to think about it. When when a, when a person is uh, is light, then they stand. Uh, you know, in a dark place, and all they do is they shine. But when you're talking about. Um, being salt, it, it requires you to mingle with other people because, like you said, salt uh, yeah. in a shaker by itself uh, can't, uh, you know, be by itself. If it's just in the salt shaker, it doesn't do anybody any good. But if it's, um, you know, if it's in um, a container of, uh, I'm sorry, if it's in a, a, you know, a meal, like, you know, maybe a, a piece of, um, a, a, you know, maybe rice or, you know, some other uh, ingredients, then it brings out the flavor. So a lot of times people think about being a light that stands alone in the darkness. Uh, but when you talk about salt, you're talking about mixing and mingling with others. So I don't know, maybe that could have been uh, what he meant. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, well uh, if I give somebody else a chance, and then I have some more thoughts. But, All right, but so uh, if, if not, um, I'll just mention, you know, to be salt, we have to mingle with people who are different than ourselves, and we have to get out of our comfort zone. <laughs> you know, we'd rather stay at the salt shaker. I, I, I sort of compare the church to a salt shaker, and, you know, it holds the salt, and, and they're in a safe place, and, and we don't, and, and um, you know, and salt likes to mingle with salt, but it, it's, it's harder to get out of our comfort zone. And mingle with people that are different than ourselves, and maybe we even have the fear we'll get contaminated. You know, <laughs> so it is harder. It's a, it's uh, going against the flow Amen. of our Christian lives, so to speak. Because we rather stay where we where people are like us, and think like us, and eat like us, and etc. But that's not our calling. Salt is meant to change and, and to transform. And ingredients different than itself. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, I'm going to uh, mention also that you know I, I was talking with some individuals, uh, and you know there are some people who have the opinion 
that you know God's only purpose for some people's lives or God's only ministry for some people is simply you know staying at home and taking care of their family and not ever ministering to other people not ever stepping outside and you know that is a way in which a person uh, or at least a mentality that can kill a church because our ministry is Jesus didn't you know say that the gospel shall be preached to all the world uh, and uh, you know and then shall the end come only to have people stay at home and not do anything and not preach the gospel uh, and just stay at home taking care of the needs of their own family uh, so you know salt uh, the, the analogy of salt requires outreach so on one second Excuse me one second. We're having a uh, tech problem here. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that. Okay, so as I was saying before, um, you know, if a person is salt, it, it, it by nature salt requires outreach because if you're in the salt shaker, you know, you're not doing anything any good. But once you mix and you mingle with the food, you bring out the flavor of the food. You know, without without salt, uh, the food can often be bland. It can it can be lacking something. It might not be tasty. But when you add salt to it, uh, that brings out the flavor. Uh, and allows people to really enjoy it when it mixes and mingles with the other ingredients. So the very nature of salt requires mingling and mixing. And that's something that often makes a lot of people uncomfortable because it means that you can't just stay at home and, uh, and you know, keep to yourself or keep to those closest to you and not step outside uh, of yourself and preach the gospel. And so Jesus's ministry for humanity was a mission of outreach, not, not just staying to ourselves. Uh, even when you think about how Jesus um, reached more and more people, uh, he sent the disciples out two, to, two by two to different locations. So it wasn't all about everybody kind of like sticking together in a close-knit group and just staying together, but rather actually branching out and making themselves uh, accessible to outsiders. And nobody's saying that that's an easy task and that's something that, you know, doesn't require a lot of discipline or doesn't require, um, you know, a mentality that, that that's patient. But rather, this, this is what we're supposed to do. The gospel of the kingdom has to go out to all the world. When you think about the gospel in the context of the three angels' message, the Bible tells us that the angel goes to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. That doesn't happen when people just stay at home and watch television and take care of only the needs of their immediate family. We actually have to go out to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. And what's interesting is that you know, um, Jesus didn't commission the work of the gospel to angels. He could have, but he didn't. Instead, he commissioned the gospel to humanity. We become co-laborers with Christ. Uh, I think uh, it was Paul that said that we are, um, what was the word that he used? He used the, word, he used the term, um, 
ministers of, uh, of reconciliation. So we become ministers of reconciliation uh, to go out and to share the gospel with the rest of the world, which means that we have to be about doing outreach and not only keeping to ourselves in our own little bubbles. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at the, uh, oh, see, we got a comment coming in, then we'll go on to the next section. So let me go ahead and grab it. All right, Andrew, you are on the air. Okay, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I was saying, going to say that uh, salt can be used on sidewalks in the winter. I'm from Michigan, and in the, in the winter time, it can, the road can get icy, and if you use salt on, a, on the road, it can help at the right temperature. It can help the it can help the road be uh, the ice to dissolve with the salt because, and then it, it's, it's love because love is supposed to carry those people that do, that help the roads and actually make the roads better, the sidewalks. And the salt, is a, the salt can be a dissolving agent for dissolving the ice. And that can help uh, the roads be better and the sidewalks to be better so people don't hurt themselves. And also, in, like what John was saying, is in the salt can be used in a recipe to make it more flavorful to make it better to eat and so and and when we when we flavor our lives with christ and the love of christ when we flavor it with him we're 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 whole christians and we're able to minister to the needs of other people that the, those that are broken those that are hurt those are that that are really damaged by the devil like the like uh the uh the man on that was beaten up by thieves in the story of the good samaritan christ was able to help that person by by the good samaritan and we're to be like the good samaritan and help those misfortunate people Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Now, Jesus does warn us here that even though we are salt, that salt can lose its savor. Now, when, what, are you, what was he talking about when he said that salt can lose its savor? Um, in what way is that possible? So he says here that, um, thence for, uh, sorry, if the salt, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Well, some of the ways that we can lose our savor is when we become more like the world rather than changing the world. So if you have salt and you add the salt to uh, other ingredients, the salt is supposed to influence the flavor of that recipe that you have. But if the salt doesn't have any flavor, if it's lost its savor and, and uh, you add it to something, then it doesn't change the taste of what it is. It's just there, but it's not really doing its job. And so therefore the food is still bland and it, it throws off the entire recipe and uh, makes it good for nothing. And just, you know, basically to throw into the, um, into the, uh, into the garbage. You know, I actually had, uh, recently had the experience. I was trying to make scallion pancakes and uh, you know, I didn't add enough uh, of what I needed to have. I, mean, I definitely didn't have enough salt in there. And so, you know, I asked my wife to taste the, uh, the scallion pancakes that I had made. And of course, when she tasted it, she put it right back on my plate and said, nope, you didn't get it right. So, you know, basically that whole plate of scallion pancakes that I thought was going to turn out good ended up getting thrown out because it had lost, you know, it didn't have the right flavor. And so we as Christians are supposed to influence uh, those whom we come in contact with. And our influence is supposed to leave a lasting impression. But if we don't have any savor, if we don't have any influence over those whom we, get, we come in contact with, because we're trying to be just like them, we lose sight of who we are and we, don't, and we basically mess up the recipe. Um, and so uh, we're, we're told here that as the salt of the earth, we're supposed to influence the taste of the other ingredients. And so what is, you know, how effective are we in our Christian ministry and, and in our outreach to the world? Are we making a difference or are we trying to be so much like the rest of the world that we're losing our influence over the world? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really, a, a, you know, every, I'm sure many Christians go through the struggle of, you know, trying to keep the friends that you've always had or, or trying to figure out how to minister to people's needs or how to get close to them and how to build relationships, but at the same time, not crossing that line of being just like them in character. Um, so, you know, of course, when you become a Christian, there are certain things that you don't do because you become 
you become a new creature. But at the same time, um, if you, in trying to mix and mingle, I mean, Jesus mixed and mingled with sinners. He, he, uh, he gained their trust. Uh, he got them to follow him. Uh, you know, we, we see several examples where when Jesus was eating and drinking with them, uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees said, you know, this man eats and drinks with sinners. And Jesus responded to that by saying, um, you know, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he said, it's the sick that need a physician. So there's a balance that we have to strike between um, mixing and mingling with those who need to come to the knowledge of Christ, but at the same time, not losing our savor and becoming just like them. So um, <clears throat> if we're too much like the world, uh, you know, we, another way that we can be too much like the world, we can become legalistic. That's another way in which we can uh, lose our savor. Um, you know, rather than uh, being not religious at all, we can become overly religious uh, to the point where we lose sight of what the message is really about. And two examples of that were, were the Levite and the priest that passed over the Samaritan because they didn't want to become ritually Im impure. Uh, they had lost their savor. They had lost their opportunity to, to make an influence on the recipe by uh, focusing too much on ritual and missing the point behind the rituals. Ultimately, all the rituals of the Old Testament were to point us to Christ and point us to mercy and compassion. But they had missed that point and passing over the 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 the, uh, the the Jew who has fell among the thieves, and you know today sometimes some of us uh, through adherence or or or, or overzealousness uh, can lose sight of what's important and pass up opportunities to have compassion on people who need compassion. So there are many different ways in which a person can lose their their savor or lose their flavor. Um, and as Christians, we want to make an impact on the recipe, uh, you know, to make it taste better. And so the only way that we can do that is by mixing and mingling with people, but making sure that in mixing and mingling, we don't lose uh, what, what we have to give. I'd like us to go to um, John chapter 4, verse uh, 35 to 38. Which says, say not ye, there are yet many, oh, sorry, say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye be, you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. So what does this tell us here about the church and how it spreads the gospel? What are your thoughts? Looks like we got a comment coming in. You are on the air. Okay. Well, I think that uh, there's it, it's showing us from John chapter four, verse thirty-five to thirty-eight. It's showing us through Christ's word, Christ's words Himself, that um, that there's many different there's many different uh, positions to bringing in the harvest. And so it's like, there's, if you read in verse uh, 36, there's gathering in the fruit for eternal life. There's sowing, there's reaping, there's rejoicing. And so the, there's many different um, positions to bringing in the harvest. Some people, some people are sowers, and of course, Jesus is a chief sower. And uh, there's reaping, and there's gathering in fruit. There's lot, many different positions to gathering in uh, the harvest. Mm -hmm. And so we're to we're to work collectively as a church, not just one group. 
offshoot here or one little offshoot there, but as a church movement and bringing in the harvest because each person has something to give that is unique to themselves and that they would be, they're the ones that able, are able to give it and are able to make it fruitful for the harvest. And that Christ would be pleased if we're as long as we're faithful and we do our part, each person doing their part. Amen. Thank you, Andrew, for that comment. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that the lesson brought out was that, see, up until this point in the lesson, um, basically we've seen examples of how uh, the mission of the church is to do outreach, is to step outside of itself and to go and to reach people uh, for the kingdom of God. But after this point, we see that the, uh, there are different ways in which a person can do ministry. So first, it's established that uh, we should go out and do ministry and step outside of ourselves. The next thing is that it's established that there are different ways uh, in which a person can do ministry. Right, hold on one second. Okay, so uh, there are different ways in which a person can do ministry. Uh, first of all, you have the people who prepare the soil. And when you look at the parable of the sower, you see that the soil basically represents people's receptiveness to the gospel. Uh, you know, sometimes it's blocked by, um, by thorns, by the cares of this life. Sometimes it's blocked by rocky ground. Sometimes it's blocked by, um, you know, uh, the birds that come and take the, the, uh, the, the seed away uh, to prevent it from making a, 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 a deepening uh, impression. Um, but, you know, one of the jobs that we have uh, as Christians is to prepare the soil. So sometimes before anybody can be reached, they first have to be a little bit more receptive to the gospel. And, you know, uh, the, the pastor of your church might not be able to reach an individual the way that you can. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good the sermon is, no matter how good or knowledgeable you are at Bible study. Um, you know, if a person doesn't want to listen to you and if, if they're never going to open up their door to let you in, then you can't reach them. So there are individuals who have the ability to knock on a door and to gain access to that family in ways that nobody else can simply because of the relationship that they have, which softens them and opens them up to the gospel. Okay. So there are people that say you, for example, can reach that I can't reach because I don't have that relationship with them. And because you say to them, hey, you know, you really need to give this a, a listen. They uh, will take your word for it and open up and listen simply because you've asked them to. I know I have many friends who, you know, if it wasn't for uh, me being the one to reach out to them, they might not ever open up a door to a person who's knocking on their door uh, to talk to them about the gospel, simply because I have a friendship and a relationship with them. So the preparers of the soil uh, can just be, you know, people uh, who reach out to those closest to them that, you know, may not even be interested in the Bible, may not be interested in the gospel message, but are willing to listen to you simply because of the relationship that you have with them. Other times, you know, the church as a whole can be about preparing the soil and that we go out into the community and build relationships, meeting the needs of people. And by meeting the needs of people, we can actually um, prepare the soil that way because we, we uh, uh, cause people to become more receptive by showing them that we care about their needs. So how do we do that? You know, maybe it's through uh, a health ministry. Maybe it's through, um, you know, a, a daycare center. There are all kinds of different creative methods that churches use uh, to soften up the hearts of the community, uh, to show them that we care about them, and then ultimately uh, draw them to the gospel through the love that we demonstrate on behalf of Christ. Now, a second thing is, of course, the sowing. So in other words, it's not just about um, going out into, into the community and showing people that we care about them, but we also want them to hear the words of the gospel. So if you have uh, you know, a daycare center or if you have a, um, you know, a health ministries and you're doing all kinds of wonderful good things, but the gospel is never given to people, then you've done a lot of good things, but you've never sown the seed. You've never introduced them to the gospel. So at some point, there has to be teaching that takes place. There has to be uh, administering the word of God to give people a chance uh, to relate to it and to, and to either accept or reject it uh, by their own choosing. 
Now, once the once the seed uh, has been sown and once it, it 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 finds its roots in the soil, it has to be nurtured. Uh, you know, and and you know when you when you sow a crop, you know you have it, has, it needs uh it needs rain, it needs sunlight in order to continue growing. And there are those people who have the gift of nurturing, and uh, you know really helping a person to grow in their knowledge. So a lot of times, you know, you think about how you have an evangelist that comes to a church for a week, and the person may preach a great sermon, and you know people stand up and they get baptized. But then as soon as that evangelist leaves, people no longer remain in the church. You know, they start dropping off little by little by little. That's because we need to nurture them. We need to continue the process of growth. It's not just about planting and leaving it alone and letting it fend for itself, but rather we need to nurture individuals so they can grow in their knowledge of Christ and grow into the full crop that Christ designs that they be. And then, of course, once they become that crop, there's the, 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 the part in the process that deals with reaping where the individual gives their heart to the Lord, the, ind the individual becomes converted and wants to have, and wants to uh, complete their relationship with Christ and go all the way with him and become sowers themselves. All right, uh, see, we got a comment coming in. You are on the air. Uh, I was uh, thinking as, as we look at, uh, at Matthew 13, as we look at uh, Jesus talking about the sower uh, casting the seed, and it falls on rocky ground, it falls in thorns, it falls uh, in, in good soil, or whatever. Uh, it, is, it is not just, oh, well, some of the soil is going to fall here, oh, well, it's going to fall there. It's a mandate to take the hard soil and break it up. It's, it's a mandate to, um, to get rid of those thorns. It's, um, it's a mandate that God is giving that um, we don't settle for bad soil. We work on it. We see what is missing. We do an assessment of that soil, um, of that land, and uh, we do everything we can to make sure that where the, where the seed is going to fall, that it is um, that it will be it, it will fall on on good ground amen so there are many different ways and, and people with different and gifts whole thing, i'm sorry go ahead no i'm just saying and this is this is a process you know very often we we emphasize the reaping part, because that, that frankly, you know, that's the most fun part. <laughs> we, you know, getting our hands dirty and pulling weeds and cultivating and breaking up soil, that it's kind of dirty work, but it's, you know, it's necessary, but we like the reaping part. <laughs> and sometimes we, it's very often, it's easy to focus on the reaping and, 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 and the, you know, just having events, reaping events. But really, we have to focus on the whole process, as you so well said, and uh, and not leave any of the steps out. And there will be a harvest if we follow this this process. And it could be that many, like like this chapter four, John says, you know, it's a teamwork. Like you said earlier that though know, everybody has a part in this, and no one person can get all the credit for doing their part of this process. Mm -hmm. so, so, let's, so let's not just think of events. Let's think of a process and be willing to do what it takes and to wait for this, for things to grow. And Amen. don't think, think we're a failure if things we don't have a harvest immediately. Amen. But be faithful to the process. Amen. You know, I, I agree with what you said that, uh, you know, it is a process and it's, uh, you know, a lot of times we like to skip to the end of the process as opposed to going through the steps that are needed. And uh, when we when we do that, I think a lot of times we see um, negative consequences result. Uh, you know, and, and if you want people to really uh, grow into the full measure of what God has designed them to be, then you know they need that nurture, they need that care. You know, it's important to sow the seed. It's important to nurture it, and then you know eventually you'll get to the reaping part. And of course, breaking up the fallow ground in order to be able to um, you know to, 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 for the person to be receptive enough to receive the word. Um, now let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse five to 10. Which says, these 12, G uh, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into, the, uh, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel 
And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold uh, nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey. Neither two coats, neither shoes, nor, uh, nor yet staffs, for the workman is worthy of his meat. So here we see that um, Jesus sends his disciples out to the surrounding towns and villages, and he doesn't give them, he doesn't allow them to take any resources with them. And in so doing, um, basically, they're forced to rely upon God rather than rely on themselves. Now, why do you think uh, Jesus sends them out this way? Why teach them to rely upon God in this manner? Isn't it true that sometimes uh, we as, as, um, as Christians, uh, when we see success or when we do things, when we accomplish things, we start to think it's us. Because I'm such a good preacher, people are getting converted. Because I'm such a good Bible worker or because I'm so good at singing, people are drawn. And so we start to think that the gospel is all about us and we become selfish. But when Jesus sent them out two by, uh, two, by two and when he taught them uh, to go out and, and, and not to take things for their journey, they had no choice but to rely upon God for their needs. Because when you're going out and you're doing all this work and you don't have money with you, you don't have enough food with you, you have to rely on the kindness of other people. And uh, you know, in doing so, you don't know whether somebody's gonna get angry with you or throw you out. You don't know how people are gonna react or respond to what you're, what you're saying to them. So in one sense, it creates a, a certain amount of humility in that you know, when, when your livelihood depends on their receptiveness, you tend to care a, lot, a whole lot more about whether or not they are receptive. But also on the other hand, um, you need the Holy Spirit to open up and to soften every heart. And so it teaches you reliance upon God because without God, you know, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work the way you want it to. Um, you know, you're not going to get uh, the level of receptiveness except that God is, is moving on hearts to receive the gospel. A lot of times when we, when we do things uh, in the work of God, we think it's us that's doing it. But really, a heart cannot be receptive and accept the gospel unless it's God himself that's moving on that individual to accept the gospel. So it's not about so much us, but rather it's how God is working through us. Uh, and I like this part in the lesson where it says um, that it would teach them dependence on God and also the importance of creating friendships through service to the local residents. The local residents would then value their service enough to provide support for the ministry. So in other words, if you went out and you know you were just inappropriate, you know you were you were nasty and mean, but you're you're preaching the gospel. You might not eat that night, but you know it, it teaches you a certain level of humility uh, in order to uh, reach the people that you're trying to save, and that and that ultimately God is is trying to bring back into uh, His family. Um, <clears throat> and so they had to rely on God in order to make that work and create friendships um, and and actually be invested in these people. Because in order for them, for the people to invest in them, they had to invest in the people first. All right, see, so we got a comment coming in. You know, and it, and it begs the question, you know, do we today uh, invest in people? Are we, is our heart really in it? Do we really invest in their well-being or are we just going through the motions? All right, uh, Andrew, go ahead. You're on the air. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Audio okay? Audio okay. Audio's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, okay. Um, well, I was going to say that in the harvest, back to the harvest and the question, the part where he was, John was talking about with the harvest, the, that was right. And this is actually, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the rain of the Holy Spirit to ripen the harvest. And that precious Holy Spirit is able to be maintained in our lives by earnestly praying according to Colossians chapter 4 verse 1 and 2 earnestly praying and earnestly persevering and when we persevere and we have this maybe we maybe maybe we don't have a friendship with Jesus but when we persevere with that friendship with Jesus and we gain our friendship with Jesus and we persevere with that friendship with Jesus, he'll send the rain. He'll send, he'll send the rain, the Holy spirit, and it'll ripen the harvest. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. So, um, we've run out of time for, uh, for this week's lesson. I just want to uh, make a few closing comments. I mean, we've seen how the, the gospel is very uh, emphatic about us being the salt of the earth, us being the light of the world and reaching out, stepping outside of our comfort zone and reaching out to other people. And then once we step outside of ourselves, God has different kinds of work for us to do. Not everybody is called to the same thing. 
Some of us are sowers. Some of us are, are nurturers. Some of us are uh, to break up the fallow ground. Some of us are, you know, like preparing the soil. Uh, some of us are reapers. Uh, we all have a different role to play. But the one thing that the gospel emphasized in, in, uh, in Matthew is that we all have a role to play in, um, in, in the labor. So whether or not we're the sower or the reaper or whatever part we play, we're all entered into the labor. So even if another person reaps uh, what another person sowed, uh, you know, that's okay because we're all working in the same field. We're all working for the common good. And so uh, the point here is that we are to work together as a church to reach out to our community uh, to, you know, cause them to be receptive to the gospel and give their lives to Christ. And, you know, our talents may be different. We may have different roles to play in that. But uh, God is working through his people to reach souls for his kingdom. And in order for us to be effective at our jobs, uh, we have to rely entirely upon God uh, to bring the increase. Uh, because without God, as a part of the process, we labor in vain. Okay. So uh, with that said, uh, I just want to give the uh, closing thought uh, to Dr. Uh, May Ellen and Dr. Uh, Gaspar uh, Cologne. Uh, Jesus sends his disciples without anything that is going to establish themselves in the community because he wants them to, to <clears throat> nurture relationships, uh, assess needs, become uh, desired in the midst of that community, and, um, and to the point where the community itself, the people who are being served, will recognize it and, and give it enough social capital or, um, or value that they, will, that they will want to keep them there and, um, and, even, and, and even support them. So <clears throat> going out there without our own resources uh, helps us to realize that we have to create these relationships. <clears throat> yeah, and if they if they had gone and set up a center, a self-sufficient center in that community where they were sent, they wouldn't need to have any relationships mm -hmm. <laughs> with anybody. And so this is this this is motivating for them to form relationships, and and then with the community, and then the community can actually help them, and then. And in the, in the Bible study guide, it actually has a story about Pastor Frank that did that. He was sent out into the community with no resources. But after a while, the community rallied around him because they saw that what he was going to do was going to be a real blessing to them. And so they helped make it happen, the community itself. Amen. So one of the best ways to plan the church mm -hmm. As I said in our lesson, is to first plan a ministry that really meets a need, and then have a church grow out of that ministry. And that's uh, that's what happened in the story of Pastor Frank in our lesson. Amen. Thank you uh, so much for your for your commentary. And I just wanted to uh, let the listeners know who are uh, who are watching um, where they can uh, get your your uh, your book. Uh, Dr. May Ellen and uh, Dr. Gaspar are the authors of uh, the Sabbath School Companion book, uh, Adventist Churches That Make a Difference, uh, which I believe is available through uh, the Adventist Book Center, uh, Review and Herald, and also on uh, Amazon.com. And uh, if you haven't picked up the Sabbath School lesson for this quarter and started studying, you know, we have some amazing lessons in this book. Uh, so far, we've covered about five of them, and next week we're getting into uh, lesson six. But, uh, you know, you don't want to miss these lessons because they are uh, excellent. Talking about the church's role in the community and how we can make a difference uh, you know, in the saving of souls uh, just before Jesus returns. So uh, with that said, let's just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunity that you use us, Lord, as human beings uh, to reach souls for your kingdom and to participate in the work of preaching the gospel. We pray that you would continue to bless us and guide us, Lord, and move us with your Holy Spirit uh, to touch lives and hearts and to truly make a difference and to make an impact on those whom we have influence over. Help us, Father, to prepare the soil. Help us, Father, to sow where uh, sowing uh, can be done. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, guide us as we nurture uh, those whom you put in our path and help us, Father, to reap uh, that we may draw souls to your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you would guide us in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.